know what it means when somebody pays you minimum wage? You know what your boss was trying to say? It's like, hey, if I could pay you less, I would. <laughs> but it's against the law. Nonpartisan experts say it would send more people to the unemployment line than it would lift out of poverty. Because the $15 minimum wage would eliminate almost a million and a half jobs. Now you're telling employers that they have to hire people at a certain price. They may think that the employee's not worth the price and just not hire them. It's not giving them any of the money. By raising the minimum wage, that's not helping. But I think it should be a state option. They had massive inflation, sky-high unemployment, all because of minimum wage. The American economy was in crisis. Rampant materialism, blatant political corruption, extreme gaps between rich and poor. The rich had lavish dinner parties, multiple sprawling homes, and enjoyed luxury vacations while the poor worked nonstop to keep up with crippling debt, often failing to earn enough wages for rent and basic groceries. One might say it was both the best of times and it was the worst of times. I'm talking, of course, about the Gilded Age, a period in the mid to late 1800s where the United States saw massive industrial growth followed swiftly by hyper concentration of wealth into the hands of a few captains of industry or robber barons depending on who you asked it was then that the united states steel company emerged as the first billion dollar corporation in the united states based on market capitalization anyway while the rich were busy buying up every business building and politician they could get their hands on conditions for the working poor were worse by the day between the 1870s and the start of world war ii sweatshops began popping up in every major U.S. city. Now, if you haven't heard of a sweatshop before, here's what it is. It's an apartment community which had been converted into manufacturing facilities where workers lived, work, slept, and raised their families. During the Gilded Age and through the early 20th century, the concentration of wealth among a few entrepreneurs allowed for many once thriving apartment communities to be converted into dual use, manufacturing, and living operations. This was extremely profitable for landlords, manufacturers, and distributors. But for the workers in the sweatshops, conditions were hellish. Competition for manufacturing contracts was fierce. And because so so many industries had been hyper concentrated into a few companies, workers had essentially zero bargaining power. All a working class family could do was ask for less money than their neighbors in the hopes of securing a job. This not only led to wages being suppressed, but it led to deplorable conditions in the sweatshop communities. You see, a monopoly is what you get when a company dominates an industry or a commodity to a point where it alone has exclusive control of its supply. During that time, monopolies had so much power that anyone lucky enough to get a contract working for them would take just about any deal and any rate of pay, no matter how unfavorable it was. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. While working poor scraped by on meager wages and sweatshops, the rich got richer. This trend continued all the way up to the 1920s. This period, known as the Roaring Twenties, was nothing short of a party for wealthy elites. A new class of young elites experimented with new music, late night parties, scandalous fashion, and basically all the sort of debauchery that would make your grandmother's grandmother blush. And while wealthy Americans bought new cars, yes, they had cars, telephones, Yes, they had phones too. And vacation homes, they also gambled in the stock market. And boy, did they gamble. New investors with cash to burn poured money into the stock market at unprecedented rates. From 1920 to 1929, stocks ballooned over 400% in value. The Dow Jones Industrial Average increased 600% from 1921 to September of 1929. To the average investor, it seemed everyone who was buying stocks was was getting rich, so they dumped more and more money into the market. It was a roaring party, and so long as you ignored how thin and hungry the working poor looked, it was the best of times. By early 1929, the stock market was on an unprecedented eighth year of consistent growth. No one wanted to miss out on the money party, so they took out loans to buy even more stocks while prices were at all-time highs. Now, let's be clear. Most investors were individual people, but the biggest investors were institutions like banks. Banks which used customer deposits to get loans so they could buy more stocks so they could get more loans to buy more stocks to get even more loans to buy more stocks so long as the market kept growing and growing forever, everything would be fine. 
until the market crashed in 1929. Customers panicked. They rushed to rescue their life savings only to find the banks were empty. Their cash was used as collateral for banks to gamble in the stock market. And when the banks defaulted on their loans, the cash was gone. In an instant, America's rich had no cash to pay bills, no credit to get loans, no collateral, and the stocks they had spent years buying up were worthless. The working poor absorbed the brunt of the Great Depression's wrath. 25% of Americans lost their jobs. Real wages collapsed by over 42% between 1929 and 1933. And mind you, the minimum wage did not exist. Homelessness skyrocketed. Tents and shacks sprouted up around major cities. Some called these collections of makeshift huts shanty towns, while others called them Hoovervilles, since many Americans blamed then-President Herbert Hoover for the housing crisis, unaffordable cost of living, and unemployment. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt replaced Herbert Hoover in office, the United States was in crisis. Roosevelt promised to turn the tide of the Great Depression. What followed was a massive campaign of economic reforms to pull America out of ruin, starting at the very base of the economic pyramid, working class people. Backed by labor unions and political groups of veterans and unemployed workers, Roosevelt urged Congress to pass the Fair Labor Standards Act, which among other things included the nation's first ever minimum wage. At the time, the minimum wage was a revolutionary idea in the US. The first minimum wage was to be set at 25 cents an hour or $5.42 an hour in 2023 dollars. Congress and the Supreme Court saw the wisdom in providing minimum standards of living for U.S. people and immediately threw their support behind Roosevelt's New Deal. Just kidding, they fought like hell for five years. Most notoriously was a Supreme Court decision in 1936, where Joseph Topaldo, the manager of a Brooklyn, New York laundry, was charged with paying his workers only $10 a week in violation of the New York State minimum wage law. When Topaldo was ordered to pay his workers $14.88 a week, Topaldo forced them to pay back the difference to him. This led to Topaldo being jailed on charges of violating the state law, forgery, and conspiracy. Topaldo challenged the New York state minimum wage law, and by a 5-4 to four majority vote, the Supreme Court voided the law, let Topaldo go, and said the minimum wage law was, quote, a violation of the liberty of contract. This, of course, led to immediate backlash because many in Congress, some of which didn't even support Roosevelt but had a change of heart after this decision, ultimately felt that this legalized indentured servitude all in the name of protecting profits. President Roosevelt punched back in a radio broadcast and he warned, quote, do not let any calamity howling executive with an income of $1,000 a day tell you that a wage of $11 a week is going to have a disastrous effect on all American industry. Roosevelt implored Congress to take action. One third of our population, the overwhelming majority of which is in agriculture or industry, is ill-nourished, ill-clad, and ill-housed. A self-supporting and self-respecting democracy can plead no justification for the existence of child labor, no economic reason for chiseling workers' wages or stretching workers' hours. Now, after the dust had settled, the Fair Labor Standards Act was eventually signed into law in 1930 establishing the minimum wage at 25 cents an hour, just in time for American industry to make enough boats, vehicles, planes, and exploding things to help the Allies win World War II. But when the Great Depression, World War II, and FDR himself had passed, the Fair Labor Standards Act and the minimum wage law remained. The minimum wage has since changed several times, and it reached its peak purchasing power in 1968, when the minimum wage was $1.60 an hour, or $13 an hour, in 2023 dollars. So while the late 1960s and early 1970s were arguably the best time for minimum wage earners, many believe it never quite lived up to Roosevelt's dream of a true living wage. This has gone on long enough that today there's been some debate as to whether the minimum wage was ever meant to be a living wage. But the evidence shows that at its inception, the minimum wage always was intended to be a living wage. In 1933, President Roosevelt told Congress, quote, 
the law I have just signed was passed to put people back to work, to let them buy more products of the farms and factories and start our business at a living rate again. Roosevelt continued, it seems to me that no business which depends for existence on paying less than living wages to its workers has any right to continue in this country. And by living wages, I mean more than a bare subsistence living. That is straight from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, folks. The intent of the president and the evidence we see from the 1930s is clear. The minimum wage was always intended to be a living wage. Now, how successful it's been in achieving that goal is, of course, always up for debate. But there is no mistaking as to what a living wage meant to the president and his allies in Congress when the first minimum wage was signed into law. But the minimum wage law does not have an inflation tracking mechanism or any scheduled increases. The way the law is written, Congress must convene on its own accord to raise the wage. In fact, the federal minimum wage in 2023 is just $7.25 an hour, an amount which has not changed since 2009. It has been 14 years and counting since the last time Congress adjusted the federal minimum wage. During that time, working class people have found that their paychecks, while growing slightly, are less and less capable of meeting the bare minimum needs, food, rent, medical care. In the 2010s, the rising cost of living and stagnant minimum wage gave rise to the Fight for 15 movement, a grassroots campaign which advocated for a new nationwide minimum wage of $15 an hour. Like FDR in the 1930s, these calls were denounced as socialism, communism, entitlement. But unlike FDR's New Deal, the fight for 15 never achieved its goals. Today, the data shows worsening conditions for minimum wage workers. In mid-2023, the median price for a new home broke $400,000. Combined with high interest rates, this puts home ownership out of reach for even relatively high earners. The high cost of homes has led to a high cost in rent, and just paying for shelter alone is becoming impossible for minimum wage employees. A minimum or near minimum wage earner simply cannot afford to rent a modest apartment in any U.S. state. Some cities with federal minimum wage jobs are more affordable, but as CNBC reported in September 2023, residents of those cities still need an average of three and a half full-time minimum wage jobs to afford a basic two-bedroom apartment. In cities with wages higher than $7.25 an hour, it takes an average of two and a half full-time jobs to make rent. The data is clear. Minimum wage cannot sustain a single person in any U.S. state unless the cost of living is dramatically decreased or wages are dramatically increased or ideally some reasonable combination of the two things. But there's still some reason to be optimistic. The United States uses a federalist system of government where the federal, read national government, sets laws which apply to all 50 states, and the states are free to add their own layers to those laws so long as they don't challenge the federal intent. In this case, minimum wage, states are free to make a higher minimum wage if they choose. As of the posting of this video, Washington has the highest state minimum wage of $15.74 an hour, and California comes in second place at $15.50 an hour, although many counties and cities within these states have higher minimum wages. And the trend is going upward. California will soon take first place for the highest minimum wages because in April 2024, fast food workers employed by national brands with over 60 locations will be entitled to a $20 an hour minimum wage. And by 2028, the minimum wage for healthcare workers in the state will be $25 an hour. Now, Many people rightfully point out that California has the highest cost of living of the U.S. states, and some point to the minimum wage as the cause. It's a reasonable assumption. But the causes of California's high cost of living and whether minimum wages are an appropriate response are much more complex than the simple equation of low wages equal low cost of living. It's just not that simple. Indeed, there seems to be persuasive, if not conclusive, evidence that low wages contribute to poverty rather than avoiding it, which of course is common sense. But on a macro level, things get more complicated. Research from the Economic Policy Institute suggests that a higher federal minimum wage would lift between 2 and 4 million people out of poverty. But 
data from the Congressional Budget Office is a little more dismal, suggesting that only 1.3 million people would be lifted out of poverty, while families above the poverty line would see an average of 0.1% reduction in their income. In theory, because of a supposed reduction in business income, but exact causes, of course, are not certain. So there are many unanswered questions to be addressed here. First, are we living in a new gilded age? And if so, what can we do about it? Second, is it time for Congress to raise the minimum wage? And if so, how high should they raise it? Third, should businesses be responsible for paying a living wage to their employees? And if not, where should that responsibility lie? And finally, in a nation as economically powerful as the United States, is there any justification for a working person to not be able to afford food, shelter, and medical care through their jobs? I don't have the answers, but maybe someone in the comments does. And hey, if you liked the video, or if it at least made you stop and think, drop a like, hit subscribe. It really helps as we start making more long-form content. I can't take no loss. I don't even know what it costs.